Have you all heard, is this new class? Have you heard Emily yet? Emily Dotson? You heard her on Wednesday night, didn't you, or something? Well, she, she goes to that church. She's the one that got a heal. She's the one that came here one time in a seminar like this. And she was dying with lupus. And there was no hope for her to live with lupus. Incurable. And she went back to the tape table and bought my audio tape series on how to live and not die. On the way back home, they began to play it in the car. And she began to see if she'd do the right thing, she didn't have to die. The Holy Spirit would heal her if she'd say the right words and accept Jesus by faith and resist that lupus that Jesus' name was powerful enough through the ministry of resisting to make it leave her. And it is. You know, if you if you make up your mind, you'll worship God, and you submit yourself, therefore, to God, resist the devil, he will flee from you. And he'll take all of his cancer with him. He'll take all of his lupus with him. Now, are you ready for this? He'll take all of his AIDS with him. Totally things incurable. I went to New York one time to speak in a large church downtown New York, a one night meeting. And I was speaking that night and so forth, you know, and got through speaking, prayed for the people, you know, and there's a whole busload of people came from Connecticut, all the way from Connecticut down there, you know. And as I, I remember, remember specifically because as I walked out, I walked on the side of the building, that a whole bus load of young people began to you begin to scream out, yell, We love you, Brother Novo, we love you, Brother Novo. And there's a sit on there from Connecticut. And so now I didn't know see, I didn't know what was going on. Uh, he told me about it after he got here. There was a Spanish boy, uh, assistant to the vice president of the United States. He got the job because he had the highest, highest IQ. And he had AIDS. He took AIDS. He happened to be in New York. And God just worked it out for him. I don't know how he got to the church, but anyway... Somebody gave him something or something, a flower or something, and he saw it. And uh, so he came over there, and he said, I was sitting there. And the doctor says, well, you've got AIDS, and you'll be dead in a year or two. He said, I was sitting there, and he said, and while you were speaking, you mentioned New Life Bible College, that you had a Bible college in Tennessee. He said, just as plain a voice spoke to me, just as plain, I'm sitting in that meeting in New York City in that church. He said, a voice spoke to me just as plain and says, if you would drop out of your career at the White House and go to that Bible college, you could be healed. And he's a real nice Spanish fellow, real nice looking fellow, looked like he's about maybe 28 years old, 30. And he came here. After he came here, then he told me his story. And I says, well, I'm, I, don't, I don't put up with AIDS. I curse AIDS in Jesus' name and drive it out of people. How do you drive it out? Well, you resist it in Jesus' name. Folks, you need to understand this. Jesus' name, when it's spoken with authority, is stronger than all diseases. I mean, he's the healer, and he's the miracle worker. I mean, he's actually a divine healer. There's nobody else a divine healer. He paid the price for the straps on his back. And if you will do what he says to do, and if you'll do it correctly, 
And if you'll submit yourself, therefore, to God, just like the book of James says, submit yourself, therefore, to God. And then if you know anything about the ministry of resisting, which many Christians don't know too much about it, but one of the most important ministries in the world to you after you get saved, understand this, because I know the love of God is, is, is the most important, but after the love of God, the most important ministry in the world to you after you get saved is learning the power in Jesus' name and learning the ministry of resisting. Do you understand that? Because stuff that comes and puts us cold, clammy, death hands on you like lupus and AIDS and cancer and all that kind of stuff. There's all kind of people out there, folks, get involved in all kind of sin and all kind of diseases and all kind of this and all kind of that. Well, they don't usually have anybody to help them. You know what I mean? Hardly nobody in the world that gets involved in AIDS don't have anybody to help them. Let us happen just to drop into a church like this sometime, you know. There's other churches can help them too, I'm sure. But you have to resist that thing. So I told the young man, I said, well, I don't put up with the AIDS. I said, I, I curse that stuff in Jesus' name and command it to die in Jesus' name and resist it and command all of it to come out of you. He said, I want you to pray for me, Brother Norville. And do that. I says, well, I will. And so I prayed for him. After I prayed for him real strong, I sat him down and taught him what to do. I said, well, you've got to carry this out, man. I said, you've got to do it. you got to do what Jesus tells you to do. You have to submit yourself, therefore, to God. Not do your own thing, but submit yourself. And you have to resist the devil. You may not feel no, no release of AIDS, the symptoms of AIDS now at all. But you resist that thing, and I'll resist it, and we'll resist it. The whole school will pray. We'll pray. I said, you got to be kidding. You, you have to take that. So he stayed here and went through school. Graduated from school. He went down and got, a, he got him a job at the television station in Dalton, Georgia. Called me up. He says, Brother Norval, I got, I've got my letter from the Medical Association that I am totally free from all symptoms of AIDS. So, by that time, the next year, we had a new crop of students, so I had him come up here one night, stand right here, and give his testimony. What happened to him? I met me in New York, what the Lord told him, and he came here, and we prayed for him, and real nice fellow. He gave up his career with a big salary, you know. You know, when you're being a, when you're assistant a aide to, to the vice president of the United States, you have a good job. They pay you well. But the Lord told him, said, if you'll drop out and give that up, go to that Bible college, Go to his Bible college, you can, you can be healed. See, understand this, folks. You can't be healed everywhere. With age, you can't hardly be healed no place. You'll find a few churches that will fight that thing for you. But most of them don't get involved that deep. They just get involved in laying on of hands and just kind of, you know, which that's good, it's scriptural, nothing wrong with that. I don't want to speak slightly in of hands because I do that all the time myself. But when something comes along and the doctor's medical science says you're going to die, well, you better learn the power there is in Jesus' name. And you better curse that thing in Jesus' name. That's the very reason I couldn't, when Zona took those 42 growths on her body, I prayed for five years. And other people prayed for her for five years and she didn't get nothing. But the Lord, one night I began to cry out to him for about two weeks. Brother Hagen told me at my house, I mean, well, about a block from my house, he told me, he says, I could make them things leave her, them gross leave her. He told Zona, 
He says, don't I can make them leave you. Well, I thought to myself, well, la ti da ti da 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 <laughs> I've been praying five years. <laughs> they're, just, they're, they're, they're bigger than bigger and uglier than those than I started. <laughs> well, I begin to detect folks that my prayers wasn't working. <laughs> then he comes floating out. He, he'd been up in New York. On his way to nice one, come floating through and is going to stay three or four days with me at my house. And he says, uh, Zona come in. He said, ah, oh, Zona, how you doing, honey? He says, oh, she says, she says, you're going to high school. She says, oh, I'm doing just fine, Brother Hagen. But she said, it's my daddy. He says, your daddy? What's wrong with your daddy? He says, Dr. Lowe said if I come to the hospital, he would... I put me to sleep and keep me in the hospital one night and operate on me and cut all these growths off of me. I have 42 of them. Look at them run all over my arms and all over my hands, all over my legs. They've been on me for five years. Brother Hagin says, oh, I could make those things leave, leave you, Zona. <laughs> Just like taking a drink of water. Well, I found out he was telling the truth. But he left the next morning because the Lord told him in the bedroom of my house, he said, <clears throat> you better leave. You, 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 I want you to get up early in the morning and leave. And I want you to drive straight to Dallas, Texas. Because your sister that's 55 years old, she's let cancer come back up on her again. See, she took cancer. Brother Hagin had a sister, 50 years old, that took cancer. And he went and prayed for her, and God healed her. And she stayed healed for five years with no trace of cancer. But she failed to feed her faith. Have you heard that this week yet? She failed to feed her faith. So unless you feed your faith, it don't mean you don't love God. It don't mean you don't love God until you die. But see, your faith produces benefits. It don't mean you get saved over again. You're already saved. But the right kind of faith, the Hebrews kind of faith, will produce benefits. And there's over 3,000 benefits from Genesis to Revelations. And your faith, if it's strong enough, can produce any of those benefits. Well, one of those benefits, even a gift to the church, is miracles. Another one is healings, plural, healings, gifts of healings. Different kind of healing. But in my knowledge of God, I couldn't, I couldn't get, I, could, I knew how to pray. I knew how to do, you know, several things. But I couldn't get God to uh, take those gross off his own his body. And I was responsible for her a lot because she was my daughter living in my house. Now, when you're a child, gets gets grown and gets married and moves out from under your roof, then they're pretty well on their own. Now, your faith will work in part for them. You know what I mean? If Reggie prays for me right now or something, his faith will work in part for me. In fact, if I was sick, he might lay hands on me and pray for me and I might be healed. For once, maybe even twice. Once in a great while, you'll see God heal somebody maybe two or three times of a minor ailment through somebody else's prayer and through somebody else's faith. But when God performs a miracle for you or a great healing for you, he says that you overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of your testimony. Well, Brother Noble, I get tired telling it. 
I don't have no testimony no more. I used to give my testimony in my healing, but I get tired. You better not get tired telling it. As long as you tell it, if the Lord's ever healed you, as long as you tell it, you can stay in health. But you get tired telling what the Lord's done for you. See, you overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of your testimony. The word of your testimony, not somebody for you. <clears throat> you say, well, I'm afraid the people in my church will get tired of hearing me tell it so much. Well, I didn't make no difference. You're not telling it for them. If they're well, you're not telling it to them anyway. If somebody is sick, you're telling it for their benefit. Yeah. And besides that, you need to hear it yourself. <clears throat> And besides that, the Lord says, do it. And he says, do it. Just go ahead and do it. So he left the next morning, Brother Hagin did. And Brother Hagin come knocked on my door at 1 o'clock in the morning in my house. I went to the door and he's standing there. And he says, I was praying in there in the bedroom, Brother Norval. He says, I was going to stay with you three or four days and just pray and have some fellowship with you. But he said, the Lord told me to get up early in the morning and leave and go to Dallas. He said, I, no, I never met his sister. I had been close to him for years, but he says, I, uh, he said, I have a sister that had cancer when she was 50 years old in Dallas, Texas, and he said, I prayed for her and God healed her. Now she's 55 and cancer's come back up on her again. And he said, uh, he said, the Lord told me in there a while ago, he said, get up early in the morning and go to d drive straight to Dallas so you can see your sister again before she dies, the Lord said, before she dies. And he said to Brother Hagin, he says, now, when you get to Dallas, he said, I want you to leave early in the morning so you can see your sister before she dies because she's going to die real soon. When you get to Dallas, don't pray for her because I'm not going to heal her. Well, that like to blew my charismatic theology, you know. <laughs> I said, now, Brother Hagin, wait a minute. I said, now, what do you mean the Lord told you that he's not going to heal her? I said, the, the Bible says that healing is a gift. And you have not because you ask not. It doesn't say how many times, does it? Now explain that to me. He said, okay, I will, but then I'll tell you what the Lord told me. He said, she was responsible after I prayed for her. The Lord healed her completely through my faith. And he said, she was responsible then because she's a grown woman, 50 years old. Now, when you're 50 years old, you're supposed to have some brains. You're not 14 no more. You've had many years to learn the truth. And he said, she is supposed to... Uh, give a testimony. You overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of your testimony... And you're supposed to keep your faith built up. He said, the Lord told me, I says, Lord, what can, what can I pray for? I, I want to pray for her. She's my sister and I love my sister. He says, no, don't pray for her. There's no point in praying for her because I'm not going to heal her. I healed her one time through your faith because you asked me to heal her. I healed her. But son, you can't carry a grown person. You can carry your children until they get up pretty good size. But you can't carry, the uh, older a person is, the more responsible they are for their own faith. You're more responsible for your own faith when you're 50 years old than you are when you're 30. You should know more about God and more about faith when you're 30 than you did when you're 15. Your little children growing up at your house, you can pray for them and God will heal them through your faith. But you'll find out when they move out of your house and get married and have children, they get up 25, 30, 35, 40 years old. You can't get them healed every time the devil attacks. You know what I mean? Sure, you're going to go pray for them. It helps some. He said, she's 50 years old. She's responsible for her own faith. And he says, if you'd only feed your faith, my word. Now listen to what Jesus told him. He says, she loves me and she's going to come to heaven. Son, I can tell you that now. She's going to come to heaven. Well, she's losing her life because she let her faith get weak. 
She didn't feel her faith. Well, listen to what he told you. He said, let me give you an example, son. You have a radio broadcast 15 minutes a day, five days a week, there in Dallas. If she would have only listened, now listen closely. <clears throat> if she would have only listened to your radio broadcast most every day, her faith could have stayed built up to the point that when that cancer tried to attack her again, she'd say, no, you don't. Jesus is my healer. <clears throat> no, you don't. I will accept this. The Lord Jesus Christ is my healer. No, you don't. You can't put this back on me. You can learn that, see, from his teaching. And you feed your... He said, she could have fed her faith enough to live. But he said, she'd go for days and never listen to your radio broadcast. If she had just took 15 minutes a day and listened to your radio broadcast, her faith could have stayed built up to the point that I could have healed her. You know, God, folks, requires your faith to rise up to a certain level with strength, with resisting, and with believing, and rise up to a certain quality. You can't deal with God with nonchalant faith and lazy faith. Nonchalant faith is like this. Oh, well. I know the Lord. I've been going to church. I'm a good Christian. I love God. I've been healed before. Praise the Lord. Uh, the Lord, he'll heal me when he wants to. No, he won't. You'll die. He won't heal you. Because you've fooled around and you've lost your vision of faith. You don't talk like Abraham no more. You talk like Thomas. You don't talk like Abraham no more. Abraham says, I'm fully persuaded what God has promised. He is well able to perform. Glory to God. And he's promised the gift of healing to the church. And I'm saved, born again. I belong to the church. And I have a right to have good health. and have a right to have the divine healing power of God flowing through my body. And I receive it as a gift in Jesus' name. It's mine. I confess that the divine healing power of God is flowing through my body, driving out all symptom of cancer. Driving out this pain in Jesus' name. Pain, I take authority over you in Jesus' name. Come out of me. Pain, in Jesus' name, go from me. Pain, I'm talking to you. You understand me? I'm talking to you. I command you, stop. Pain, you better hear me in Jesus' name. I'm telling you, stop and just keep on doing it and keep on doing it and keep on doing it. And eventually it will hear you. If you could speak strong enough and sharp enough, if you'd fast like two or three meals before you ever spoke the first time, when you spoke sharp, see when you fast just for one meal. It'll, it, it keeps your, keeps your flesh under subjection some. And when you pray, when you fast, it causes your voice to be stronger. Because you're closer to God when you do it, when you pray. You understand that? Then when you fast just a meal or two yourself and then pray. If you're having pain in your body a lot, why don't you fast a meal or two? And while you're fasting, pray for several hours. And then take authority over that pain. In Jesus' name. Well, I've been taking authority over it, Brother Noble, but it hasn't been stopping. Well, if you have if you have strong enough faith, you can make it probably stop without fasting. But if you can't fast a meal or two or two or three meals and pray, now I'm telling you right now that your voice will get stronger if you pray. It'll cause your spirit to be stronger and your flesh to be weaker. Blessed be God forever. And about, that, about, about the second or third meal you fast, and when you pray several hours when you're doing that, then you'll say, in Jesus' name, pain, I'm talking to you. Stop, I said. I said, stop. Remove yourself from me. 
pain, I'm going to put up with you. Go from me. Stop, I said. It won't be on this nonchalant faith. Now, pain, I, I, I take authority over you. Now, in Jesus' name, yeah, in Jesus' name, uh, now you leave me, I said. You understand me? Leave me, I said. Well, that sounds all right, you know, but it's uh, too nonchalant. And, uh, you know, the devils don't listen to that kind of stuff. You have to get spiritual enough with enough faith and speak strong enough that the devils listen to you. You know what, de- you know what devils listen to? They listen to strengths. They obey strengths. They obey strengths. The devils don't obey weakness. They obey strengths. That's the reason God wants you to keep your faith built up all the time. Keep the mind of Christ in you. That you can think straight. Think straight. Think spiritual. Think victory. Don't let defeat come into your vocabulary. Don't let defeat come into your mind. Keep it out of your mind. Keep it out of your mouth. Speak victory all the time in Jesus' name. Jesus paid the price that you and me can have victory. And you can do that if you learn how. Keep the peace. The Bible says, you know, people's always wondering about God and this and that and the other thing and climbing walls and fidgety and, well, I don't know, and God won't do this. And Well, the reason you're like that is because you don't know God very well. You might as well know the truth. Now, you may know him in the free pardon of sin, but you haven't studied the Bible enough and memorized enough stuff in the Bible. You don't know him very well. Well, you know Reggie, but you don't know him as well as I do. Because I've known him longer than you have. I've been to his church a lot of times. I know the spirit in his church. He loves the Holy Spirit. Probably more than anything on earth. He loves. I tell Brother Hagin all the time, I said, you know, Brother Hagin, Reggie Scarborough really loves you. And he said, yeah, yeah, Reggie's a good fellow. I said, you know that Reggie, Brother Hagin, he loves the Holy Spirit. My God. I'm telling you, when the Holy Spirit starts working in his church, he's like a kid with a new, new toy. I said, man, he just gets, he don't even want to leave, don't want to go home. He said, I said, every time I go there, he's the same way. He loves the Holy Spirit. I said, man, you take a pastor that loves the Holy Spirit that much, he's going to come and visit your church a lot. Well, I'm just telling you that he does. He comes where he's welcome. The reason the Holy Spirit don't do a lot of work, work in a lot of churches, he's not that welcome. You have to welcome him. You have to want him. Folks, if you want Jesus the healer, you can find him. Those that diligently seek him shall find him. Brother Norval, I'm sad. I'm unhappy. I don't have no joy. Well, the only thing you need to do is seek Jesus, the joy giver. And if you'll diligently seek him and pray like a house of fire, I want joy, God. I want joy. I want you to hit me in the top of the head with joy and let it go through the bottom of my feet. I said, I'm, I'm tired of this beaten down, half sad life and my mind, half confused. I resist that stuff in Jesus' name and I want the joy of the Lord to knock this stuff out of me. Lord, give it to me. Give it to me. Well, you do that for a few days and one of these days God will hit you. And man, you'll be laughing while you're running around the building. You say, really? You think that could happen to me? Well, if you act like you want it, it can. It's amazing what can happen to you if you just act like you want it. But you have to act like you want it. Faith is dead without action. And it's so easy, folks, to believe God because if it comes a time you need to believe God with strength, all you have to do is remember what Paul said. Enjoy the patience of God. The Bible says contentedness is a sign of godliness. You need to be contented all the time. Contented all the time. It's a sign of godliness. If it comes time for you to need something from God, if you don't, if you think, well, I need some more strength, all you have to do is stir up the gift that's in you. Stir up the gift that's in you. 
Let me give you an example. If I'm dictating a letter to a secretary, somebody comes to the door, knocks on the door, and one of the girls, but the novel, there's a man and woman out here, and they have their 20-year-old son, and he acts funny. He's a football player from the University of Kentucky. And he's got involved in stuff and acts strange, and, and they want you to pray for him. So I go out there, you know, and here's a nice couple drove down here. Just drove down here, thought I'd be here, you know what I mean. Sometimes I am, sometimes I'm not. Drive down here with him. Here there stands a sharp-looking boy, you know, football player, University of Kentucky, and he's going. He's got involved in some goofy stuff that's got a hold of him, and he can't get rid of it. Now, they can't get rid of it because nobody knows how to resist the devil. And maybe they don't even know the importance of worshiping God. See, if you'll bow on your knees and worship God in your house, I don't care what kind of stuff your devil has put on you. If you'll submit yourself therefore to God and resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Well, I'm dictating a letter about a business. I'm not in the gospel service. But you here stand somebody that's going to have to have the devil cast out of him. He needs a prayer of authority in Jesus' name to take authority over that thing. Well, so what do you do with the novel? Well, what do you think I do? I just close my eyes, shut myself off from that letter and business part, start stirring up the gift that's in me. I just close my eyes, lift up my hands, start saying, the one that's in me is greater than he that's in the world. I don't care what's happened to you. The one that's in me is greater. He is greater. He is greater. Jesus' name has authority over all devils and all diseases and all confusion and all unhappiness. Because his name is greater. He paid the price that you might have peace and be normal and enjoy yourself in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for that gift. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And start confessing who Jesus is pertaining to his case. I have to do that for a minute or two or two or three minutes. Say in Jesus' name, come out of him, I said. And that thing will leave him. He'll break and start crying. And the Lord will heal him right in front of your eyes. Amen. And they take him back home healed. I said, that goofy thing you've been involved in, you better not get involved in it no more. Yeah. The devil trying to steal your mind and mess you up, son. Stay out of sin. Go to church and serve God and pray and read your Bible and go to church. And I said, you'll be all right. You'll be just free. Don't get involved with them goofy people. You know, people get involved in all kinds of stuff. Just all kinds of stuff. I was holding a meeting one night, Reggie, and all of a sudden it's just, I was just speaking. In Indiana, I believe it was. And all of a sudden... A young boy looked like he's about, I don't know, 16 or 17. He just fell out on the floor, sitting in the end, fell out on the floor. Just like pitching a bag of potatoes out of a truck, just whoop. Just fell out on the floor and just t- doubled up like this. And I said, oh, brother, excuse me. I went back there, you know, and bend over him, you know, and he's like this right here, like a knot. And you couldn't even pick him up. He, I mean, his body was like steel, brother. His arms and everything was like steel. Well, I began to break the power of the devil over him in Jesus' name. Glory to God. And commanded that thing to leave him. And I broke the power of the devil over him in Jesus' name in a few times. And the Lord set him totally free. And I noticed he had these bracelets on his arm. You know, like Satan and weird words and stuff, you know. And I says, and then when I got him free and he's weeping and God set him totally free. 
I said, now, son, I said, how'd you get involved? Where have you been for that devil to take a hold of you that strong? I said, man, you had some devils holding you strong. I had to break their power. I had to get rough with them. He said, well, he says, I didn't mean to get involved in anything. He said, I just, I just, they wanted me to come and visit, visit the Satan church. And I went and visited the Satan church. And they put this bracelets and stuff on me, you know. They said Satan and stuff like that, you know. He said, now I knew something weird was happening to me, but I didn't know what it was. You know, sometimes teenagers are just got suspicious minds. And they want to go out, you know, nice boy. But, but he says, then I come over to the service tonight. I didn't know if there was something, something, something weird was happening to me. Then you still kept talking about Jesus and kept talking about the blood of Jesus and how much Jesus loved us and stuff. Boy, those those things that had got a hold of me, I didn't know they were holding me that strong. I'd never been in a service before where there's this kind of power. But boy, they were mad at me for being in here. And that's the reason they knocked me out of my seat and turned, kicked me over just like this and possessed me. He said, I sure appreciate it. you making them things leave me. I said, well, son, you better not go to the devil's territory no more. And I said, rip them bracelets and stuff. Give me them dumb things. And I said, don't, don't, don't wire no stuff about Satan. I said, don't you go over to that place no more. You understand me? You can wreck your life forever. I said, you can die at an early age, man. I said, don't you do that. He said, okay. He said, I won't do it no more. He, but he's just involved in that a little bit, you know, and he didn't know that that's that, 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 that strong. The only thing he knew that something was bothering him and he kind of felt weird. You know what I mean? But he came into a Holy Ghost service. Boy, and I was teaching the Bible and them things hit him. They wanted him out of there. You know what I mean? Knocked him out of the seat down the floor. Well, the devil is stupid anyway. See, if he'd have been, if he'd been quiet, he might have sneaked in and sneaked out. But them devils are crazy. But the gospel brings that they can't stand they can't stand Jesus' name. They can't stand the gospel. They can't stand the blood. They can't stand it. But I'm telling you, if you've got faith in Jesus, you don't have to put up with no devils. Devils folk have lost their power. They don't have no power. The only power they have over you is what you don't resist. Well, what does that mean? Well, you've let them work too long in your flesh. Don't let devils and diseases work in your flesh. The moment that you feel like something's wrong, I don't care if it's your heart, or your elbows start getting a little stiff, or you start hurting some part of your body, that moment, rise up in Jesus' name and start resisting that thing. No, you don't. You're not going to put this on me. I'm not going to take this. In Jesus' name, get out of me and resist it in Jesus' name. And you're trying to get stiff in the joint. Say, no, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> your, your knees start to get stiff and stuff. You say, no, you don't. In Jesus' name, no, you don't. In Jesus' name, no, you don't. Go, get out. Get out. Get out. Get out of my knee. No rheumatism in Jesus' name. Get out. Limber up, I said. Mm-hmm. And you keep on. <laughs> you, have to, you have to show the devil, folks, he can't have you. You don't have to get hyper and stuff like that. One of, the most, one of the most important things in the world, folks, is enjoy yourself. Enjoy your Christian life. Enjoy Jesus. And one of the most important things in the world to you, to keep you out of the world of doubt and unbelief, is get your own human spirit in your own mind and feed your mind God's Word, see? Keep, feed your mind God's Word and feed your spirit God's Word as in your own human spirit, in your own thinking, in your own human spirit. Get yourself possessed with patience. Yes. Patience come from heaven. You understand that? And one of the things that will help you get a good quality patience in you 
is becoming a servant of the Lord. So I don't care how, what kind of ministry God puts you in charge of, if you can stay a servant of the Lord. Help poor people or help little children or whatever you, whatever you can do. Keep a servant spirit. If God wants to bless you with 10,000 people in the church and you're the pastor, that's okay. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's fine. Just keep a servant's heart. You won't have that much trouble with the devil if you keep a servant's heart. Because patience will be your sidekick everywhere you go. You can have patience if you keep a servant's heart. In other words, it keeps all the flickiness knocked out of you. I always want to help poor people, people that's beaten down and don't have nothing. It makes me a better quality person. You know why it does? Because the Spirit of the Lord blesses me. I love to go down the stairs with the people and shake hands with them and talk to them for a few minutes. Put my arms around Sometimes I go around and put my arms around everybody. Shake hands with them and just go around and talk to them. time I leave, the Spirit of God is all over me. All over me, I'm telling you. The Spirit of God is all over me. Did you ever work with little poor kids? Oh, my God. We've started bringing them in here now every Sunday. Uh, is there anybody here that's in charge of that? Bringing the poor kids in here every Sunday with the vans. Anybody in charge of that? How many did you bring last Sunday? Yeah. About 20 to see last Sunday. Well, it'll just get more and more and more. Now, I began to help a fellow because the Lord told me to here in town. And he had, I think he had one school bus, I believe it was. Now, I mean, I wasn't the cause of all this, you understand. But I, I just help a little teeny bit. But I thank God for that little bit. I worked with him for seven years. In the seven years, I, I saw that ministry go from one school bus to eight school buses. You know, we had so many kids. They filled up the whole sanctuary. And his sanctuary is as big as this one, at least as big as this one. We've got about 300 kids, three or 400 kids in it. Well, about maybe 400, 450 or 500 kids in, that, in the sanctuary. You get about 300, 300 adults in there. So we had to have a service with the little kids from 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock. Then we had service on Sunday morning from 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock or 11 to 12 or or 1 or however long it lasted with the adults. But then he decided to build a little people's church next to the main sanctuary. So he stepped up by faith. It's paid for now, but he financed it and built a church called the Little People's Church. And he put, had a real strong girl, the only girl in his church. She was a Church of Christ girl, got baptized in the Holy Ghost. And sometimes on a Sunday morning, I would get so blessed. I'm telling you, I would get so blessed, I couldn't understand it. And I didn't want to leave the sanctuary. And I'd stay around the altar and pray until 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And that Church of Christ girl that was spirit-filled, she was the only one in the church that stayed with me. Every Sunday when I stayed... She was a college graduate, but she was she loved God. That girl would just cry and pray. She'd stay with me if I stayed till three or four o'clock in the afternoon and prayed around all of it. She'd stay with me all the time. And he made her the chaplain, the pastor of the little people's church. And she was a chaplain for about ten years. And the state of Tennessee gave us a bus for free because we had the largest retarded Sunday school class in the state of Tennessee. How many churches you know of that has a retarded Sunday school class? Well, you all learn this if you work with them, folks. 
little retarded children. They don't hardly have no friends. Sometimes none. Now, sometimes the parents love them. Yeah, they do. But sometimes they're not treated nice at home either. But sometimes they are. But outside friends, they don't have no friends much. Most of the time, not any. Well, I mean, Jesus is their friend. Bob see them little retarded children get their parents saved. We bring them to church every Sunday. Bring them to church every Sunday. Glory to God. Just bring them to church every Sunday. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Folks, there is nothing in this world. I'm just passing this on to you. There is nothing in this world can take the place of being a servant of the Lord. And being involved in church work. Nothing. Now the first chapter of the book of James. Look down at the first chapter of the book of James. First verse. Follow me closely now. James. James. God used to write a chapter of the Bible. James. A servant of God. Everybody say, I want to be a servant of the Lord. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into the divers' temptations, knowing this, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Now, you're not going to like this, folks. I can tell you right now, you're not going to like it. But to a lot of you, that has not taken the time to build your faith to inequality much by the Word of God, by hearing the Word of God and keeping your mind built up so you can have the mind of Christ in you. The most valuable thing in the world to you. Now, you're not going to like this. But the thing you need more than anything in the world he said, when you come to God and ask him something in Jesus' name, to do something for you in Jesus' name, it's for him to wait for a while till he gives it to you. You understand? Because if you can't, if you're not, if you're not going to, if you can't believe God, when you ask him something in prayer, if, you're not, if, if you can't stand in faith and believe God, you're not going to get it anyway. Just forget that. You're not going to get it. But if God will wait when you come to him and want a request from him, if your faith is not up to par, if he will wait a while between the prayer and the manifestation, and if you will lay your faith open to the book of Hebrews and obey that, that your faith is the substance of things hoped for. Your faith is a substance. And you see that your faith is the answer. And the answer, folks, is not someplace else. Your answer is your faith. Now faith is the substance. Substance means the answer. To what? To anything. If you will not waver, if you can keep your mind from wavering, which most people cannot do that. Because they want to rely on other Christians to get it for them. In which that don't work, you know what I mean? It works in part, works for some small things maybe, or Maybe God might do something for you along that line. Some, it does help for Christians to pray, and that helps God, it helps God do that. But if you want to work in full, don't waver, folks. Now, the reason it's so important to you for God to wait for a while for you from the prayer to the manifestation, because 
by the trying of your faith, if you won't waver, that time span in there, that time span in there, will put an ingredient in your spirit that you have to have. Now, folks, you know as well as I do, when you, when you bake a cake at home, if you leave the flavoring out and leave the sugar out, who wants the dumb thing? You know, the dumb well, I mean, if you leave patience out and leave confession out of your faith, uh, God don't want your faith. You know why? Because your faith is sick. It's too weak for God. He won't accept it. He won't accept your faith on that level. Your faith has to have flavoring to it. Your faith has to have a sweet fragrance to it. You know, Jesus' name, folks, and the Holy Spirit and the Word of God is sweet. Glory to God. It has a good flavor. And if you stay with him, brother, you'll find out that Jesus and the Word of God is a sweet-smelling Savior. Sweet-smelling and sweet-tasting. David said, he mentioned him before the Lord, why don't you just stop, stop that stuff, you know. Oh, he says, woman, get away from me. It's like it's a honeycomb in my mouth. It tastes like a honeycomb in my mouth, woman. Get away from me, woman. That's his wife. Get away from me, woman. It tastes like a honeycomb in my mouth. <laughs> Dancing before the Lord. Dancing before the Lord. I don't know about that, Brother Norm. What about dancing before the Lord? I'm conservative. Well, you start hanging around in places like this, you know. <laughs> or we don't have any better sense than to book wild speakers. <laughs> like Ellen Parsley. Wild as a book deer. <laughs> but there's one thing about her. If you fool around her, you can get free. She may knock you in the head three or four times. <laughs> she, she may push you so hard, you may slide halfway across the church. But you can, you, you, when you walk out, you'll I feel good. <laughs> Isn't that flash, Brother Norval, knocking people over? Well, yeah, but some people are so unspiritual, you need some flash. You need some... <laughs> I said, Schambach, one time he was speaking for me, and I'm walking with him, you know. He hits up by the top of the head like this. Pops. <laughs> Some of them go. <laughs> he, 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 he hit a little old bitty, a little old bitty teeny lady. Like she's a little, little teeny sweet lady standing there, you know. With glasses on. She's about that high. Looks like she's about 70 years old. I said, now surely he'll have mercy on her. <laughs> I mean, surely the God, surely Shumbach's going to be nice to her. Well, he wasn't nice to her. In Jesus' name, boom. He hit her on the top of the head like this and shed glasses on. And her glasses stuck in her eyes, and blood started running down her face like this. Two streams of it like this right here. I said, that's too heavy for me. <laughs> now, this is the truth. We got to the, we got to the end, end like this right here, and he had another long line. Was, you might got in a broken mission where you have, you know, eight or ten lines. And when we got to the line like this, there's some swinging doors. I just swung through the doors. <laughs> went through the restaurant park, caught an elevator, went upstairs, sat there and had some lemonade or something. About an hour, he prays for everything that don't move. <laughs> and I was going to walk with him, you know. But when he hit that little old lady and blood gushed out of both of her eyes like this right here, I said, uh, that's too much for me, I can't. 
And I said, I can't, I can't handle this. And I'm going to go, I said, I'm going to leave it with you. I got it. If they sue him, I'm going to tell him, I don't know, I wasn't there. I don't know, I wasn't there. <clears throat> he comes up in the room, and he says, Brother Norval, you left me. I said, praise the Lord. <laughs> Glory to God. I got the peace of God on me in the Shambach. I didn't tell him, but walking with him, I was a nervous wreck. And he said, and I said, well, I could hit that little old lady in the head, about 70 years old, and blood flew out of her eyes. I thought, I thought I'd come up and take a nap. <laughs> he, he, you, know, he, you know, it didn't bother him. He just laughed. He says, oh, well, Brother Norval. He said, there's one thing about it with me when I pray for people. <laughs> he said, there's one thing about it. When I lay old number two on them, <laughs> that's what he said. Took his big old hand to his like this. When I lay old number two on them, they're either going to get something from God or me one. <laughs> power from God or power from Shambach? <laughs> <laughs> 